Can you hear me all right? I don't have to shout. Okay, the lesson tonight, as you can see, I've given it to out a handout. It's got blanks in there for you to fill out. The question that we're asked many times when we're trying to teach somebody about the church, about, about God and, and serving God, is why do you meet three times a week? Well, the way to answer that question to start with is, I'm glad you asked that question. Do you really want to know? Now, so, the first thing you need to understand, nowhere, absolutely nowhere in the New Testament, does it tell you that you are to meet three times a week. Oh, I'm supposed to stay here so I can be on film, aren't I? You got that However, Paul told Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now how can we know God's word if we don't study? Now you can say, well I can study at home. And that's true, you can and you need to. But, when you get together and study, you get more ideas and, and you can come to a consensus of what it really means. You can rightly divide it because you you got people here checking your thinking and making sure that you're thinking the right way. Matthew 6.33 tells us, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now what if you go back and read that in its context, he's talking about clothing and or raiment and food and so on like that. So what, what God has told us to do is to take we are to seek the kingdom of God first. If we don't seek the kingdom of God first, we're not going to find it. So it's important that we find that kingdom because we there's only two places. There's heaven and there's hell. Now make your choice. You need to make your choice which you want to go to. But uh, the last time I spoke, I talked a little bit about the weeping and gnashing of teeth and it's going to be in, in outer darkness. It's going to be in hell. I don't think you want that. If you've ever hurt hurt bad enough that you gnashed your teeth, I remember when my shoulder was dislocated. It's been out 13 times officially. But when it first happened, the first time it happened, it hurt so bad that I passed out. I mean, it is terrible, horrible pain when that shoulder goes clear out of location. It's so loose now that it kind of slips out when I lay down. So it but John 12, 48 also tells us, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now what word is that? That is the word of God, the Bible that we're going to be judged by. You're not going to be judged by me. You're not going to say, well, Don's hair is gray. I don't like gray hair, so I'm going to send him to the bad place. That isn't going to happen. We're going to be judged by the word of God. So we need to know the word of God. If you don't know it, how are you going to serve it right properly? And that's, that's part of the reason. If this word is to be our judge, don't you really think that we ought to make all the effort in the world to know what it says? Because our heavenly home depends on it. Acts 20 and verse 7 says, And upon the first day of the week the disciples came together to break bread. And Paul preached unto them till midnight. Now if you go back into the old days, they probably met one day on one time on Sunday because they had to work on Sunday. Sunday was work day for them back then. Saturday was the Sabbath under the old law. So they didn't work on Saturday. They worked on Sunday. So they probably met just once on Sunday. But then in, in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, it tells us to lay by and store upon the first day of the week. In other words, so that shows that they met upon the first day of the week. Uh, we have a lesson coming up later. I think uh, Bruce is going to do it, why we meet on Sunday instead of the Sabbath. And that's, there, there's several reasons for that. Acts 5, 42 says, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Now the temple they're talking about there. The Jews had their temple, the, the synagogue, and they went to that temple every day. And they taught people. They were telling them that the word of God, that the new, under the new law, not what the old law was, and teaching them daily. So maybe, you know, maybe we don't meet often enough. They met daily in the temple and taught. Maybe we don't meet often enough, considering that. However, 
All that doesn't necessarily answer your question. There are several reasons why we meet on the first uh, meet three times a week. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now what, what that is, if you get it in its context, and you need to look at it that, is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. But what he says in there is he says he has all authority on heaven and in earth. This is what Jesus Christ is telling his apostles. Tells them to go and teach the gospel to every nature, nation and to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then he says, in teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So what he's telling them, the apostles, you teach them people, then you teach them everything that I have taught you. So why are we coming together so we can learn the things that the apostles were told and wrote down in the Bible so that we can know what we must do to be saved? To fulfill this command, we need to meet as often as possible. And as you know, being baptized is only the beginning of our journey to heaven. That is not the end. You know, people say, oh, I'm baptized and that's all I have to do. No, we, it's, uh, Revelations 2.10, the last part of it says, be thou faithful unto death. And it says, unto, not until. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That means that we are to be faithful even if it cost us our life. If we want to go to heaven, we have to have that kind of faith. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, Seeing, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of God, I will also forget thy children. Now, if you look through the New Testament, I think there's some 40 times the word knowledge is used referring to knowing God and knowing His Word. In Second Peter alone, there's six times Peter talks about our knowledge of God. And that's how we, we have to have a knowledge. You know, nature tells us that there is God. You look at, if you go out in the spring, the grass comes up, the leaves come out, uh, you see newborn calves and, and goats or whatever else, newborn babies, whatever, that tells us that there is God. But what does the Bible do for us? It tells us the mind of God so that we know how we are to serve God. Not some way that we want to serve Him, but we have to serve God in the way He says to serve Him. We don't have that choice. We have a choice, all right, but if we don't serve him the way he tells us to, it's not satisfactory. It's not acceptable. Without knowledge of God's word, we will stray from the straight and narrow way into the broad way. In, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which which go therein, thereat. Because straight is a gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So what, what Jesus was telling his apostles, or his disciples at that time was, the way to God is a very narrow way. It's not a broad way. You can't just choose, pick and choose what you want to do. He has, he has set down the rules, and this is the way, if you're going to obey Him and get to heaven, you will obey Him, not what some man has written. Now, I want to emphasize that phrase, narrow way, and I just did, because he has made it very narrow. He tells us what we must do to be saved, and he tells us how to be faithful. He tells us how to worship him. We cannot just say, well, everything, there's people says that everything we do is worshiping God. It is not. We come together here on Sunday morning to worship God. The purpose to come here is to worship God. And there's five things that we, we require, or that God requires, not we require. He requires us to sing. He requires us to pray. He requires us to, to teach or preach. And he requires us to give. What well, did I miss one? Lord's Supper. Huh? Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. Yeah, I don't want to forget the Lord's Supper. He requires us to take the Lord's Supper. That Lord's Supper is there to remind us 
that Jesus Christ died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. Without Him dying on the cross, we don't have forgiveness. There was no way. It had to be a blood sacrifice. I used to say that, you know, God could have done it any way He wanted to. No. His being required a blood sacrifice. And it had to be an innocent blood sacrifice. And Christ was the only one that could meet that. But there's other things we need to meet here. We meet to edify one another. Now the word edify, if you look it up, means to build up. To encourage. Romans chapter 14, verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith we may edify another. Paul is telling the Romans there that we are to look for the, the way that we can edify one another. Then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, now when you see that word wherefore, what does that mean to you? Look back at what he just said. When he says therefore or wherefore, what I just talked about is what I'm talking what he's saying. So he told them that they're not appointed to wrath, that they're to, to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. Wherefore, because of that, Comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as ye also do. So what Paul is it a command that we are to build each other up. We are to encourage each other to live the Christian life. We can know from these verses that we are to help one another get to heaven. It is our obligation to help one another get to heaven. And a man and wife, a husband and wife, their object is to help each other get to heaven. But in the church, for, for the, the members of the body of Christ, we are to help each other. All of us, is to, if we have somebody that's going astray, we are to go and, and rescue them. If, if what it amounts to, to show them where they're going wrong. How can we help or edify one another if we don't get together. We need to come together to encourage one another. You know, a telephone call when you're sick is nice, but you know what? A visit's even better. And then coming together. Hebrews 10, 24 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. How can we provoke one another to love and good works if we don't come together? And the other side of it is, now we've got a, we're planning on doing some door, knock, door knocking here later on. And we always go two by two. Two people together. We don't go one, one by one. Christ sent his apostles out two by two, which is a good example for us. Because why do we do that? Because we're there to support one another, to encourage one another, to help one another. Also consider this, it is not just some of our fellow Christians that we are to encourage or to provoke unto love and good works, but every one in this congregation we are to provoke unto love and good works. I'm not to just to pro provoke Don to love and good works, I'm to do Doug the same way or Jeff or, or whoever. We're to encourage every one of us. Make the point to speak to each other, to encourage one another to be a Christian. Because sometimes, you know, we don't know, I don't know what's in your life. There may be something there that you may be able to just walk up to somebody some morning some, and say, Hey, you, it's good to see you here today. And they needed that because they were down. And it's good when you can encourage somebody like that. Another reason we meet three times a week is that we, that is what we here at the Blue Springs Church of Christ have decided we need to meet this often to edify and to encourage one another. Now, where do we get the authority to do that? We need authority for everything we do. We can't just decide we want to do something. Now, in the past, when we had elders, they made the decision, and we have not varied from that. Now, as we learned a few weeks ago, and uh, I believe it was Darren talked about elders, elders are to ha have the rule over the congregation and can make decisions 
on the time and, and, and the amount of the times that we come to worship. Like, in other words, we have set it here at, at 9.30 for Sunday morning Bible study and 10.30 for worship service and then 6 o'clock on Sunday night. Then on Sunday, Wednesday night, we meet at 7 o'clock. When we have elders, they made that decision. We've stayed with that decision. We don't have elders at this time because we don't have anybody qualified. But Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for it, that is unprofitable for you. Now stop and think, but these men that are elders, that are over when, when we have elders, they are responsible for your soul. They have to give an account for why maybe I didn't make it to heaven. They have to give an account for that. That's a serious job. So what he's telling, Paul's telling them here, submit yourselves to those that, that watch over your souls. That's the job of an elder, is to watch out for the souls here. Of course, that's, I think it also really applies to all of us. We're to watch out for each other. But as indicated, we do not have quali been qualified at this time as elders. Therefore, we have a men's meeting once a month, and we may, we've made the decision to remain with us three times a week. Of course, then we have gospel meetings, too, and we meet more than that. But if you might ask me, is it necessary for me to be here at all three uh, you know, services? Is it really necessary? Consider the word in Hebrews 10, 25, said, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Consider this one word, the word assembly. It did not say the assembly. It said the assembling. Now there's a difference in that. The dictionary defines assembly as the act of assembling or the state of being assembled. Now, uh, Thayer's definition, Greek definition of what it says there, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, that is for the purpose of public worship, the obvious interpretation is that is what is commonly adopted, that it refers to public worship. The Greek word in this particular case is a noun. It is used nowhere else in the New Testament except in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. There, there it is read, rendered gathering together. Now the other words, if you've got to copy of this, there's several here that I give. There's a verb usage of it. I'm not going to name them all off because you've got it. In all, in all which places it is rendered gathered together. It properly means an act of assembling or gathering together and nowhere are used in the New Testament in the sense of an assembly or the church. In other words, it, what it's saying is we are to gather together. It is not the building. Then the command then is that is to meet together for the worship of God and it is enjoined on Christians as an important duty to do it it is implied also that there is blame or fault where this is neglected in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 the one verse I gave a while ago now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ by our gathering together unto him now if you would open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10 Starting in verse 24. I'll get there in a minute. Okay, Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have re received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be, though worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified as an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. Now, verse 26 indicates to forsake or purposely miss the assembling of the saints is a willful sin. 
And there's not going to be another sacrifice for sin. However, there is a way to, to be forgiven of that sin, and that is to repent of it. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. Now what can that fruit be meet for repentance? If you've been missing the services and it is a willful sin, how do you overcome that sin? You start attending. You, you ask for forgiveness and you start attending on a regular basis. That's fruit for... That, that's showing that you have repented. In Acts 26, verse 20, but showed first unto them at, of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. In other words, repentance shows this meet for repentance is a actual show in your lifestyle that you have changed. The word repent actually means to turn from one way and turn to another. And, that, and actually what it's talking about is turn from the world and turn to God. In other words, you do an about face and you start serving God in the way that you should. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, chapter 7 verse 10, a, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So, if we're just sorry that we missed because we got caught, or we did, we sinned and we got caught, that's not it. We've got to be sorry that we did the act. We have, because actually sin is against God. You remember when David uh, prayed after he had his affair with, with uh, Bathsheba and got caught on it, who did he say he sinned against? He said in his prayer, he said, I sinned against God. I sinned against God. And that's when we sin, that's who it's against. We may be against somebody else too, but it's against God. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6, And if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. So what we're doing when we sin, whether it's willful sin of missing the services, or whatever sin it might be, we are crucifying Christ again. He died for, so our sins could be forgiven, but we're, what we're doing, as I said earlier, we've trodden underfoot the blood of Christ. We're putting it to, to, to shame. So when we willfully miss the assembling of ourselves together with the saints, we are willfully sinning. In 2 Peter 3 9, the Lord has not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the repentance. In Matthew 6 33, again, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If we seek God first, he will take care of us. I got just one more thing. I have a question for you. If you do not like to come to worship services now, are you going to be happy in heaven? Because you know what we're going to be doing in heaven? We're going to be worshiping God. And I, I'll be honest with you, I wonder, I, well I'm sure that if you don't like to come to worship services now, you're probably not going to get to heaven. Okay, that's the, that's the speech part of it. Now we're open for questions. Anybody have a question? Paul, oh, do you want ready days? Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 25, and following. Something there, I don't know if anyone noticed it or not, but I'll wait to get over here. Okay. Well, I'm still open there, so. Hebrews 10.25 says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner or habit of some is. And then it calls, the next verse says it's a willful sin. And then it has a list down there to verse 27. And it says, but certain fearful looking of judgment and the fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Adversaries as those that reject that notion that you have to go. Anybody that opposes the commands of Christ right. is an adversary. 
Yeah. And that's the closest yeah. with the law of God. Yeah. Anything else? Anybody else? Doug. One verse I didn't get to use here while he's getting over. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go in, go into the house of the Lord. That's the attitude we should have. We should be glad when we get to go to church. Okay. Uh, you, in the first part of the lesson, you started out at uh, Matthew six thirty-three. 33. Uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and, and all these things shall be added unto you. In that, that tells us that we have an obligation to have priorities. We need to know what our priorities are. And, you know, I've mentioned this before, I think, uh, but if we don't know what our priorities are, and somebody asks you, what are your priorities in life? You should be able to tell them immediately and not have to think about it. You should know what your priorities are and be, be able to tell that to somebody and then tell them why those are your priorities. Uh, if we don't have that attitude towards seeking God first, then our priorities are wrong. We need to fix that first in our life before we can fix anything else. Now we all understand that we have to work to make a living. We understand that. But we, the first priority should be to serve God. We're not going to get to heaven if we don't serve God in the, in the way that he has told us to. Bruce? If we go back to Hebrews chapter 10... It's actually back up to verse 22. It tells us why we need to assemble. In those earlier verses, verse 22, it says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure waters. And verse 23 opens up with the same Two words, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And then verse 24 opens up three things in verse 24 and 25 that we all need to consider because they're all coupled together in verse 25 with that little word and. The first one, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That's the first one. The second one, not forsaking the assembly, assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. That's the second one. The third one, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. All three of those things need to be considered when we worship, and part of that is not forsaking the assembling. All three of these are mentioned and I guess we could probably mention 20, verse 22 and 23 are consequences of breaking the new covenant. And those consequences of we're breaking that new covenant is then wrapped up as Bob mentioned in verse 27, which, which shall devour the adversaries. Verse 22, you go back to it, let us draw near with a true heart. Well, that true heart is a heart that wants to serve God. And in full assurance, then this is, this is the thing that we need to do. We need to have full assurance if we serve God the way he has told us to, that we will have eternal life. In 1 John chapter 5, 13, John says, I write these things unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, how can I know if I've got eternal life if I don't know God's word? I can't know it. You say, well, I, I had a woman tell me one time, she says, I know I'm saved because I feel it right here. I think she must have had indigestion. Because you don't know you're saved by feeling. Now, do you feel good because you're a Christian? Or when somebody, you know, when somebody obeys the gospel and we baptize them up here, we feel good about it. It feels good. But the thing that it counts is that the knowledge that they have done, you know, we had, uh, we had a lady here, she was, what, 94? You baptized here about a year ago, and then she died about two weeks later. It was good that she obeyed the gospel. Lawhorn. Yeah. Alice, Alice Lawhorn. Obeyed the gospel at age 94. She obeyed the gospel. And it felt good. It was, you know, there was joy in our hearts when she obeyed that gospel. 
But what's really joyful, though, is when she died, we knew that she was a faithful Christian. Now, what else can I mean? You know, the, the, the scriptures indicates that we're to be happy with somebody that has died faithful because we know where they're going. We're sad when somebody has not been faithful. Is that the first bell or last? First, okay. When somebody's unfaithful and they die, we really need to be crying because they are lost. Did you have some? To go there with what you mentioned in Psalm 122.1 where it says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It kind of shows our attitude. You know, if you got kids at home and you're up on a Sunday morning, and you're going, well, we got to go to church. Hurry up. we got to go to church. Well, that's not the attitude. So we get to go to services today and worship God is what we need to be saying. Well, when we get to go, not that we got to go. When know? I was preaching up at uh, Davis City once a month, they had their Sunday afternoon service at 1.30. Well, I got back in time to go to church here. I got to go to church. Uh, or, or I didn't have to. I got to go. I, I, I was able to go, and I was glad to get here. And, of course, at that time, you was on the, the book of Ezekiel, and I didn't want to miss any of it anyway. I think it's about time for the second bell, isn't it? Or he, he's not up yet. Any other questions? Bob, one more time question. Not a question, it's a comment. Well, that's what they've all been. <laughs> I remember about 35 years ago, uh, I knew some members at Lincoln, Missouri Church, and I knew one fellow. He kind of, he's kind of the head honcho, you might call him. But anyway, they came into the, came into the services there, you know, stand around. He said, "Well, let's go get this over with." <laughs> oh, yes, well, that's really good. <laughs> and you know what? The sad part about it is, I think sometimes we all have that. I know there's times, you know, we got things planned for after church, and Don preaches a little over time. <laughs> that's normal. That's normal. <laughs> but you know, we get. And it always seems like when you really got something tight scheduled, that's when the preacher preaches overtime. <laughs> and other times you don't really notice it and don't care because you don't have a schedule. So it, but it's good. Hold, hold up a red flag, let him know that it's time to quit. Well, my wife has told me when I'm up there, she just do this. <laughs> yeah. You know, when, when the game goes into overtime, it's exciting. Why did it exciting when the preacher goes? There overtime. you go. <laughs> All right, I appreciate you all being here and appreciate your, your listening to me.